This is part one of two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. We are so glad you could join us, friends. Today, Kingsley Dennis is joining us again for our second symposia, and we want to continue consciously exploring with him. Welcome, Kingsley. So glad to have you back with us. Thank you, Susan, and everyone. It's a great pleasure. Uh, to be back and speaking with you. Thank you. In our symposium today, we're going to focus on three things. One is Kingsley's book, Breaking the Spell, and his new book authored with Irving Laszlo, Dawn of the Akashic Age, and finally, a new project Kingsley is working on, Women for a Caring World. But we'll start off with Breaking the Spell. We did touch on it a bit in our first symposium, but we're going to go back into it a little bit further this time. The title is Breaking the Spell, an Exploration of Human Perception. Just to set the tone, would you give us a a brief recap of what the book is about and what this spell is, in case somebody missed it on the first one? Yes, thank you, Susan. Uh, We did uh, touch upon this book before. Uh, slightly. That's because uh, I think some of the se- the themes and topics are uh, very central to many of the things we talk about in general. The, the The core of the book really is about our social conditioning. That is the spell, and it's looking. The book looks at how both our thinking patterns, our perception, uh, even our our social consciousness and our habits, our behaviorism a part of a multi-layered um, conditioning processes that we grow up within. So it's not, it's not about looking at any types of fault or, or anything. It's trying to be, uh, trying to take a, uh, say, objective look, if that's possible, at some of these processes that part of creating our worldview and outlook and our sense of, of our cultural identity. And the book also starts with a bigger picture, which looks at how in, let's say, modern times, although it's maybe difficult to define when did modern times begin, but in, in a technological civilization at least, we, we have a, a very a narrow viewpoint of the, of the world uh, as a part of the cosmos and the bigger picture. It's this kind of clockwork universe picture where the world around us, and especially the world which is not so much so tangible to us, is, is really cut off from us. And if we can't see it, define it, touch it, then in a sense it's not part of our reality. Whereas humanity from the earliest days has grown up with an integral relationship with the cosmic whole. But this is, this is a connection which has been um, severed in a sense. And so breaking the spell is trying to return to that sense of the enchantment, the, the mystery of living in a living universe. So that's the first part of the book by trying to say that we are part of the bigger picture and there, we are, uh, let's say, uh, cosmic humanism. That we're not mm. just we're not just you know individuals in a in a lifeless society. So that's the first part, and then the book goes into the social processes, such as uh, institutions and social systems, which become the dominant major thought patterns. And then that's the middle of the book. And then later on in the book, I look at um, let's say I wouldn't call them exercises, but I look at certain perspectives that can help us break the spell and connect again to ourselves and what I refer to as polishing the bridge. That is the bridge, which is the connection to our internal selves and also the connection to uh, the greater world around us and the energy, the energetic world around us. So by polishing the bridge is referring to the sense of both reconnecting the bridge, just like a muscle. 
if we if we mm. don't use a muscle it it gets slack so it's like using a muscle to create it stronger so and then i look at um the nature of human perception throughout these processes so that in a short synopsis is is the, the core of the book wonderful i have a question for you based on what you said I wonder quite often if, especially since the Industrial Revolution and we've moved more and more to the cities and have a 24-hour lifestyle and electric lights, if that has fueled this connection from being cut off from the cosmos because we're cut off from the night sky. We don't go out and see the stars. Most often we can't go out and see the stars. And I wonder if that's part of what's going on. Uh, wonderful perception there. And it's an aspect of it. Yes, it, it's not the the cause per se, but I think it's part no. of, yeah, it's part of what we're dealing with now, which is an obstacle to returning to that uh, mystification or that enchantment. It's mm. true. There's a great light pollution in our modern world. And if we think back to let's we call them our ancestors who would have been so much of their lives out in the open under the stars gazing in wonder and so of course you know, a lot of the the early religions or the early um, traditions and wisdom traditions they were based around the the, under, the deities of the cosmos and the stars and understanding the movement of the stars of course we, we only have to mention that a lot of the great monuments, whether it's the Egyptian pyramids or Stonehenge or other megalithic sites, they all have connection to to the cosmos. Of course, we can go back and mention the Mayans as well and uh, great cities. Um, Machu Picchu were built and designed with an understanding that is connected to a larger cosmos. And so, as you rightly say, uh, in modern life and technological life, we rarely have that um, opportunity just to gaze up and, and be mystified. And so often the questions, are, the bigger questions don't, an, don't enter our consciousness purely because of pollution, whether it's light mm -hmm. pollution, modern life pollution, and also it's what I refer to as a sense of distraction. So, mm. and I think maybe I mentioned this before that we're living in, in we reframe it in terms of time as AD, Anno Domini. I, I, I refer to it as attention distractor. <laughs> and, and so modern life can be attention distractor in many ways. Light pollution is one. Electromagnetic pollution is another. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, our, our environments are incredibly polluted with electromagnetic radiation. And I refer to the, um, the specialist, Dr. Robert Becker, who in his, in his book, um, The Body Electric, talked about our environment being millions of times more saturated by electromagnetic radiation because of our technologies, which um, in one sense we have to ask, well, how does that affect the human body? Because the human body is an electromagnetic field. Um, through our heart, pumps electromagnetic fields, our nervous system, our neuronal systems, and our heads. So that's one question which we can't, I don't have an answer for, but there must be some uh, relation. Of course, then we have pollution of being distracted by modern life and the distraction of consensus scientific ideology, which says mm -hmm. that we live in a cause and effect clockwork universe, which then takes out this mystifying enchantment. So as you say, there's many different aspects which are part of that, that um, severance or veil toward, towards um, the, the, the greater picture. Well, I'm thinking, based on what you said, it's nice to sometimes just turn off the light and allow ourselves to be mystified again. Thank you, Kingsley. Thank you. Kingsley, this is Chipper, and currently I am in the land of enchantment in New Mexico. And I've got a, a question about that book. In your introduction, you refer to the ancient teachings and write that the kingdom of heaven was always within you, within. To quote you, one of the core secrets contained within this perennial body of knowledge has been that we, as human beings, have the ability to manipulate our sense of reality. Further, that this capacity stems from within ourselves and can be developed. 
In fact, we've always had this potential. We just never knew how to understand it and thus approach it. And if we ever learned how to use it and were not ready for it, we could cause a great deal of disruption and distress for ourselves and our societies. This has always been the secret that protects itself. Yet, at all times, it has never been wholly absent or invisible. What you had, what you just said, uh, got me thinking about adaptability and how that is like a muscle. Adaptability, the more adaptable one becomes and, and is working within that mindset of being able to adapt to something, the, the easier it would be to maintain that mystery, I would think. Would you? Yes, yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chipper. Yeah, that, that's, and um, my initial response to that would be to quote um, the great 13th century Persian poet Jalaluddin Rumi, who said, organs of perception coming to being according to necessity, therefore increase thy necessity. So this, we, are, we have these organs of perception which do connect with the, in the, let's say, the world around us, the cosmos around us, our environment. And so when I made that statement, the one you, you just referred to, Chipper, um, now I'm not, I don't have any secrets myself. What I, what I put forth was, from my understanding, having looked at a great number of the perennial philosophies and, and ancient traditions, and especially in, in the book, I make particular mention to hermetic uh, philosophy, right. which is, yeah, as you said, the kingdom is within, uh, as above, so below. And so what I have inferred, along with my own thought processes and, and meditations on these on these themes is this subject that we are in a, a continual let's call it dialogue with the with the cosmos a conversation with the cosmos and as as we referred to before in an earlier conversation we are energetically entwined in the same underlying energetic foundation and so even the these recent quantum physics have talked about the observer effect upon the thing observed yes. in that yeah which we, we i think we're aware of the the basics of that which say in that when an observer or a scientist observes the object then it affects the behavior as though the object knows it's being observed which again infers this simultaneous interconnectivity so if we if we can understand that, then it's not it's not a um, a great step to understand uh, the concept that we are in a mutual to and froing relationship with the universe, and you know the universe. We, people say that the universe reflects ourselves, and therefore, if we have an intention, that intention can manifest in the universe. Well, you know, it's not just one way. We, we imbibe the universe, and so our state, of course, will reflect that mutual relationship. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, and so that can be quite powerful if you understand that our ongoing mutual relationship and, and conversation with the universe um, affects the universe, how it responds to it, and vice versa. So that, of course, is a powerful tool but we need the we need the ability to to I, I think I would feel to engage with that. You know, there's there's a lot of um, quite um, blasé statements going around in in certain let's call it modern modern thought or new thought, which says think and you will receive. Hmm. You know, this type of the secret um, uh, type of material, which says you know if you, if you think about riches, you will receive it. And I think that that's quite um, that's really undercutting and and selling short this this relationship we have with the universe is that we only you know we if we understand we have this wonderful dynamic relationship why do we want to just consider it in terms of material goods it is almost as if we you know i, I can't i can't understand this this type of misuse so that's it's a, why it's a packaging of that that contact we share yeah yeah 
that's well, well put. It's, it's a it's a consumerist um, re- deliverance of of that understanding. Right. Um, yeah, which I do talk about in Breaking the Spell. In fact, at the end, there's two short essays. One's called Spirituality and Fetishism. The other is Spirituality and Consumerism, which talks exactly about this. And so I feel that, you know, we as uh, living embodiments on this planet have a responsibility that we have to develop our capacity also to respond to the universe. It's not just, oh, really, if we have a thought, we can we can influence the world around us. Well, I think it's a bit more than that. And so the mystery traditions actually you, a person had to go through a deep and uh, engaging initiation. And that was to develop the capacity or what Rumi called the organs of perception through necessity. So we could be in a mature, responsible relationship with the cosmos. And therefore, that's not just um, a flippant relationship. We right. have to nurture it. So going back to your question, uh, Chipper, is yes, that adaptability is a part, I feel, of, of our relation, relationship and responsibility to develop our mutual conversation with the world around us. It's not just an easy package, as, as you rightly said. And, and so working on ourselves, maturing our ability to converse with the cosmos is is part of the perennial philosophy and perhaps part of the reason why we have the opportunity to develop that in our lifetime. Yes. I, what The image that came when you were talking just then is an opening of a space to be to meet that silence uh, as an equal. Um, and I, what that image looked like, I couldn't tell you, but it was mm-hmm. a very, very satisfying one. What responsibility does this carry? When we, when we open that space, when we, when we exercise that adaptability and that that respectful uh, recognition of that interconnectedness, what responsibility do we develop with that? Well, Chipa, my 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 sense of that relationship is that, in fact, we we don't we are maybe not allowed or a certain level of access to that relationship only opens up in response to our responsibility if that makes sense yes. um, thanks um that that's why i um i mentioned in the 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 part that you quoted is that the secret protects itself in that it doesn't open up to a person who's not fully ready for it that's why on a, on a on a superficial level, we may just have a, a you say um, a consumerist response to that, which says, "Oh, I wish I want to wish for a better job. I want to wish for uh, winning some money, etc." Then, if that's if that's our understanding of that relationship and our capacity, the universe will only respond according to our capacity, which may be on a very superficial level, and we we may gain some some risk, uh, feedback, i.e. we may gain some riches or something, um, because that's a sign that there is a, a relationship happening here. But I don't feel that will nurture our sense of, of growth or, or maturity or responsibility. But it may be a sign that will be a trigger to say, well, if that's relationship, then I may look into it more deeply. So um, as the saying goes, um, false gold exists because there's real gold. So those people with a, a sense, with a sensitivity, it may wish, it may propel them or catalyze them to develop um, a certain intentionality, which has responsibility. So, so I feel that um, the greater conversation or the greater capacity to mutually interact with this dynamic energetic relationship will only come about as a response to our genuine ability or capacity to have responsibility as if the universe won't won't give a a a gun to a toddler right you know it's so it's i think the main the main thing i'm trying to say in response to your question is that what we receive from the universe will be in response to our capacity because it's an intelligent living connection so our i would say our great need is to develop our necessity and our responsibility and let's see what response uh, we get in turn to that. The secret does protect itself. It sounds pretty evolution-like. And you've said that the signs of our times for humanity point to 
an evolutionary process at the moment. That it may not be an accident that we arrived here, but rather is, is an evolutionary trajectory, a planetization of consciousness, a shift where the whole planet is becoming more conscious and waking up. Would you please expand on that? For me, and I can only talk from my perspective, is that everything really is evolutionary. That, through my process of, of development, my process of, of meditating on these subjects and considering these subjects and working with these subjects, is for me, everything is part of an evolutionary path. Now, when I, that, that word evolution really is a bit of a, um, a trigger word um, because a lot of baggage comes with it. And so automatically we may have a, um, a, connection, a sense and connection with Darwinism and this evolutionary drive of, of adaptability and um, mut mutations according to our environment and even um, the sense of survival of the fittest, which um, wasn't Darwin's concept anyway. Um, that was a, a Spence, Spence's concept. Right. Yeah. So that I'm not talking about that sense of evolution, although the, it is connected. But the sense of a growth and a continual growth in development, developmental growth, and perhaps moving towards self-actualization. But for me, the the main part of the evolutionary design or pattern. See, I can't even say design because <laughs> straight away we think of intelligent design, and then we go into this this duality of Darwinism, intellectual yes. design. You see, yes. you see the see the baggage we we uh, carry. <laughs> well, language <laughs> language is tricky. I'll say that. <laughs> Indeed, and and so going back, so the the for me the central element of the evolutionary picture is conscious evolution, and conscious evolution at this moment on this planet is working through the human species, and so also when we talk about evolution of consciousness and higher, con we use this term higher consciousness, I think also that's slightly um, misleading because the word higher often has the baggage of better and, and moving up in scale, I, you know, vertical towards the sky. My sense of consciousness and con conscious evolution is, is the collective consciousness actually coming down into the earth, down into humanity and rippling through the earth and effusing the earth of this finer consciousness or let's say a consciousness of greater awareness so it's not about us trying to reach up or being high or being better it's about being having been moving towards a space where we have the capacity to allow in this finer consciousness and to be a kind of effuser across the earth and to help the earth and everything on the earth be a part to be a part of this connection of this of this finer consciousness which is part of an evolutionary growth um, to greater awareness now taking that that um, that pattern of evolutionary growth my understanding also is that the more that this finer consciousness consciousness spreads through the human species and the planet it will be a catalyst toward moving towards a planetization of consciousness, which is again a kind of collective consciousness or a collective awareness that we are a unified field of consciousness. And that in itself will trigger or will be a catalyst toward perhaps a planetary society. Now, I can't say that this is on the horizon, but it's my feeling. Now, again, that's that's a tricky subject because when we talk about planetary, planetary society, maybe the first image we get is an image of a one world government, which is an image of a totalitarian kind of, I don't know, Rothschild, Rockefeller, banking elite, you know, type of conspiracy. Yeah, um, more packaging. <laughs> exactly. And also, that's the old mind working through us. Because that model is the old mind, fear-based, top-down control model. But you see, what, what we're not perhaps taking into account is when we have this contact with a finite consciousness coming through, then this is the new mind. There's no place for the old mind. There's no place for the old energy. So if we are moving towards a planetary society, 
which includes diversity in unity, not a homogenous um, uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. True unity is diversity within it. So if we are moving towards that, then that will be in the new energies and new minds. So I don't think we have to fear about the old, you know, the old models. So that may be a physical manifestation of a planetization of consciousness as it works through um, more and more people on this planet. At the moment, we we are having, let's say, the the early stages of that. So um, that that, that I. My sense is that that's all part of evolutionary development, which is both physical and internal, i.e. perhaps non-tangible. And that for me, again, is a core concept of evolution, is that evolution is an internal process, which we can, and as a human physical species, should manifest physically within our environment so we can evolve together connect internally evolve evolve evolution involvement to in our physical external world Stupa. yes yes and again the we're, we're each becoming repeater stations and broadcasting that as as we wake up it seems we're each of us adding to that greater effect I, I also, yeah, I agree. I feel that's part of the the process, as 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 we move towards this. I, I use the term massification, but not in the commodif- commodification sense. Massification in that the masses are waking up, and so yes, it, the the it's the same as the exponential effect. The, the more people wake up, each person adds that exponential effect, and like an antennae, relays that and 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 um, boosts the signal. Yes, I think I think that's an evolutionary process, boosting the signal by by participating in that chip. Which brings this question up: What is the relationship between the human energy state and the state of our manifested reality, either as individuals or and as individuations of consciousness collaborating together? It's a good question, and I'm not sure if I can answer it. Um, in totality, but I'll, my it's, response to it's that, an ongoing <laughs> process. I think <laughs> it is, it, and it's perhaps beyond beyond our ability to know or conceive exactly what's going on. Uh, but my my feeling is that our reality and and human being is meant to be in resonance. It's meant to be a mutual relationship. Somehow we. We, we got it screwed up along the way, and um, perhaps that's what we can refer to as the fall, that, that disconnection of being in a harmonious relationship um, with our um, environment and um, in, in the, the cosmic environment as a whole. And so, you know, perhaps humanity is meant to be a cosmic humanism, to be a part of, of the, the, the families and larger families all around us. When I say family, I mean environmental and, and solar and cosmic. We're all part of within, within, within the larger systems. And so I sense that we, what we're moving toward perhaps is a realignment or a recalibration of our energetic resonance. And perhaps we can think of it in, in using the term entrainment. Um, and I don't mean entertainment at all, but the word entrainment, which means coming back in sync and so so part of this movement and part of the development of of ourselves and humanity is is moving towards putting that energetic alignment back into harmony i i my thing is that we're in a disharmonious state right now i well i think it's quite obvious if you look at humanity's um behavior towards the environment if we were in a harmonious relationship with with our energetic environment this wouldn't be so. And so look at around us and going back to an earlier question uh, that I was talking about, about the, the modern life being an attention distractor, being a polluter. Part of that pollution is, is really putting in some you know, the waves of distraction that are breaking down this, this alignment, this entrainment. So I feel that's what we need to move towards. And so it's important for me to focus on what is the, the positive and what is the, the genuineness in the world and not to focus on all the, uh, the rubbish and trash that we see 
put about in a lot of mainstream media. All the injected uh, artifact. Yeah, it, it, it it's real pollution, and and it's you know what the, you know you are what you eat, and so if we eat bad news, and then that's what we put out that, that kind of disharmonious relationship. So um, I, I feel we need to move towards a recalibration and entrainment, and that is perhaps realigning the fall. I mean, I, the fall does have religious connotation, but I think it has a also a, a pertinent image that we're falling away from our um, original organic natural uh, contact and relationship with with the greater world. And so it feels, in a sense, that humanity on, on, on this planet is in quarantine. Um, and part of that quarantine is is in reflecting in our worldview. You know, this dominant scientific paradigm that we that life on this planet um, has been an accident that we just emerged from the primal primordial soups and that we are living on a lifeless rock hurtling through vacuous dead space i mean i mean let, let's look back <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to laugh yeah you know the, the scientists say that life is um, the universe is not biased towards life well you know we've gone Science says that we've gone through between five and 20 major extinction events a major on this planet. A major extinction event is when sometimes up to 90 percent of life is wiped out. Now, if if the universe and therefore our uh, Earth was not biased towards life, then how can we keep coming back so strongly after each extinction event? I mean, duh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, what my sense is that as we tend, as we will move towards realignment and recalibration with this um, uh, living universe energy, then we will also change the world view to realigning with a sense that the universe is teeming with intelligent life, and the universe is biased towards life, and that will have that will be a new era for humanity, and that. Perhaps will end the quarantine, the quarantine of, of dead universe, accidental life, um, humanity can do one type of worldview, which is which is way beyond its um, its life and, and needs to be changed radically and quickly, and that will be a new era. And I hope that we will start to will be our generations will start to live that. I think it's inevitable. <laughs> mm. Thank you. It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be. And uh, yeah. Hi, Kingsley. This is Dave. As we, as humanity, begin stretching towards the new harmony and realigning, uh, that requires breaking free from the cognitive systems that are like that quarantine you were speaking of and that hold us back. Are these parts of the system's conditioning or spell? and to try to sell us on the current illusion um, to us so that uh, they try to create meaningfulness within our perceptual prisons uh, or those quarantine cells uh, because you don't see the prison bars if you don't wish to ever try to escape? Hi, Dave. Um, exactly so, yes. And that analogy of not wishing to escape if you don't see the bars is quite true. Now, um, if, if we take this worldview that we've just been talking about of life being an accident in a in a dead universe then that worldview actually supports um, a commodified lifestyle because if if there is no meaning to life no great goal or, or um, transcendental purpose in life if you're not moving towards something then life is what we make it in this one lifetime and so that, I think, has been an underlying factor, maybe not consciously in, every, uh, in everyone's mind, but certainly unconsciously and subconsciously, that we have to make the best of this life. And that is then fuels a, a materialistic lifestyle of, of being the best we can be in a materialistic context and, and finding meaning in the objects around us, because if life's an accident, then you know, where's the meaning? Where's if where's the fulfillment in life which we're just going to live and die and, and that's it. So that worldview does feed into the commodified lifestyle. So we cannot particularly you know I think they're both mutually 
and dependent. So we can't put blame on one or the other. It's just this era uh, that we've been passed, we've been passing through of industrialization and the certain scientific um, clockwork worldview has fueled this social consciousness. And so that then um, feeds back into our, a lot of our social systems. Now, on one side, we can say that our commodified lifestyle is a type of conspiracy in the sense that it's it deliberate and it's set up to keep us happy. And also, it's part of our our bureaucratic lifestyle in that our social systems have become so complex in modern life because they need to be complex in order to socially manage a burgeoning, um, increasingly urbanized social environment. And so that bureaucracy also is a way of making life dull and taking out the enchantment. It's socially managing us to our social systems. So as a response to that, uh, you know, people have been hankering after and demanding um, entertainment to, to make their lives um, full of, of some kind of distraction or meaning or fulfillment. And so entertainment and commodification has been a response also to the burgeoning sense of bureaucratic um, social systems. And so there's kind of a, a, a vicious, vicious circle there. So part of breaking the spell of this vicious circle is is trying to find enrichment in our inner lives. So if we can have enrichment in our, in our inner lives and, and find that there is this wonderful, enchanting world inside and we can connect with the greater cosmos by connecting with ourselves, that is an, it's a primary first step of then disconnecting from all the uh, worldly pollution because we won't need it in the same, in that way, because we'll find um, true meaning in our self-development and self-actualization. And so my experience is that through following that path of, of self-development and self-meaning, just the, you know, the, the commodities and distraction of the world just fall away because they have no, they have no um, meaning. Just like um, I think the analog analogy I mentioned in our previous talk, if you light a match in a dark room, the darkness disappears. If you light the flame within you, within yourself, then the distractions lose their temptation. And that's my experience. And so we have to start moving towards a new worldview, a new consciousness, a new perception. And that will be the light that would just start to organically, naturally distinguish these, the old mindset of commodification, etc. Yeah, as we've moved through the ages and the centuries, we've gone through periods of abundance and absence, um, scarcity, and now uh, in more recent times, uh, significant abundance, at least for a number of parts of the world. And so the people that are in there have tended to lean towards those distractions uh, for lack of connectivity to their societies. Uh, but now as, uh, once again, we uh, reach new levels of populace, the number of individuals who are finding that the distractions uh, are not providing the quality of life, from my perspective, uh, is, is the, and they're looking now to the inside, uh, trying to find greater meaning and, and so it does make sense that this would be that time when we would be looking to, to break the spell and um, find those higher qualities. True, and it's not going to happen overnight. I think that's quite an important thing to say, is that you know, we don't move towards new eras or new mindsets um, like a big bang, just boom, it's wake up one morning and we're all there. Um, no, it's, it's, a larger, it's a larger time process in evolution terms, um, this process that we're happening on um, through the human species is happening very fast, but we will have to see it um, generational. And so we have this worldview will start, I feel, will start to emerge, especially as the newer generations are coming in and, and the young people are being born and, and see the, the craziness of the world. I feel that they will naturally uh, sense differently and will start to um, manifest this, this, these new perceptions. Um, however, in the meantime, um, we, have, we also have to realize that there are many countries now who 
I mean, rightly so from their perspective, they are wishing to have this, this level of, of um, goodies, let's say, that the industrial world and, and the Western Northern Hemisphere have had um, for the past um, at least half a century and then a century after the Second Industrial Revolution. Now, they've been looking to, to these developing countries and saying, well, I want some of that, especially because these, the industrialized countries have been deliberately in exporting this in, in, under under the ages of globalization yes and so and so you see these countries developing the the obvious ones are china and india and a lot of south um, asian um, countries and also countries in the middle east the young people are watching satellite tv they've been going out and buying the, a lot of western goods in their local shops and they're saying, well, now it's our turn to industrialize and, and to have and to have, you know, all the goodies because they they've been lifted up. Um, the wave of development has passed over and lift, they're lifting up to more, um, let's say, middle class um, status. Again, it's very vague to use these terms, but they've been um, lifted up. And so this wave of development, they are reaching out. Now, this is dangerous in a sense that, you know, if we have to pass through another um, half a century of, of other countries having the same level of commodification that the West has indulged in, the planet is going to have problems. And so this is a, a situation we've had, in, for example, in climate talks, when the industrialized countries have said to the developing countries, you can't emit that, that much pollution because it, you know, it's going to be really, it's going to be disastrous for the planet. And these nations have said, um, well, you've, you know, we needed to industrialize and you did it. Are you trying to stop us from industrializing? Are you afraid of our competition? So you can you can understand these mindsets. So this competition and this perspective is not going to lead us into the space where we need to go. It's not going to lead us towards a harmonious, sustainable future. So what has to change, therefore, is the underlying consciousness and perception, because unless that changes, we can see this battle of, of industrialization happening through developing countries. And so we can't turn around and say, don't do it, because who are we to preach? The only answer has to come through a new mindset in the new younger generations growing up in these countries. And I hope and I do have faith that consciousness and perception will start to change this through the generations. And so this will be a kind of in organic uh, from within growth, Dave. Wow. Thank you very much for uh, clarification and elucidating on that. Thank you. Kingsley, in your book, you speak of the importance of our inner homeland and speak about some of the practicalities for supporting it. Could you describe what our inner homeland might be or look like? And then give us some examples of these practices that you recommend, such as stepping away, being vigilant, and managing our own energy. Thank you, Susan. Um, those terms you mentioned, which I've talked about um, in the book, which are stepping away, being vigilant, and our homeland. Um, in fact, I came across these themes and these terms in other, when I, in other traditions and wisdom traditions, and and so they're not new. Um, what I've, what I'm trying to do is really, I suppose, join the dots and to present material in modern parlance, in modern vocabulary, so we can connect with it. Um, nothing what I, I don't feel I'm doing anything original. So, um, so I'm, I'm using these terms, so I don't, you know, can't take any credit for that. But in a homeland, uh, Susan, is actually, as, um, I suppose, a modern translation of a term that I did come across in, in some Eastern traditions. And it's, it's hard to describe it or to say, describe, say what it looks like because in fact it's a state mm. and you know and so the inner homeland i would say is each person's sense of connecting with the self so we often we talk to ourselves well i do <laughs> i don't think, i don't think i'm crazy i just naturally talk to myself um <laughs> on a daily basis and so what i've come to realize is that i i let's say i recognize the voice that talks to me i i i, I say it's my voice or um, it's the voice that is within me. And so recognizing the, the taste of that voice or the taste of the state is, is a recognition of perhaps the inner homeland. 
And so just as everyone has a different response to the taste of the food they eat, no one will have the same response, but everyone can recognize their own taste. So is the inner homeland. And I feel it's important to have a, a recognition of that taste because it's a place to go to, return to, a place to develop a conversation with, which I feel we need to develop a familiarity with. So whatever's happening in the outside world, um, whatever is whatever chaotic events or tumultuous events in the world, we know that we have a, a place of familiarity um, that nurtures us, that looks after us and protects us. That is a state of the inner homeland. So we can always go back to it. And so these um, terms I talk about, about stepping away, really means connecting with the inner homeland, that state, and being able to be in that state throughout our days. So one example I give is if we're traveling, we're commuting to work, we're on a, a busy subway, metro, underground, you know, people are this noisy, you, you hear the the dissonance of, of, of music blaring from underneath people's headphones, mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all, this, all this daily dissonance and distraction. Well, it, it can and does affect us. And stepping away, really, is just stepping back into ourselves, almost as if we're um, changing into low gear, we're ticking over. We still have an awareness of what's happening. Obviously, we need to be aware of what's happening around us so we can you know, be safe. But we just disconnect from that dissonance and we can start to perhaps um, reconnect with moments in our lives where we had great joy or great energy. By re reconnecting with those memories, we are in fact reconnecting with an, an energetic state that we memorized. But those memories never dis disappear. And I, um, I realized that by connecting with a joyful or energetic memory, it helps to energize us in the present, as if we're reconnecting with, an old, with a, a battery we have stored in us in somewhere. And also we can again, put up a kind of um, veil to this dissonance in, in the world, but only on a, on a short-term effect for the time we need to be. So stepping away is nurturing that state. Um, and so that connects in with managing one's energy because we are in a, in a mutual interchanging energetic state with everything and everybody around us, as we've talked about in terms of energetic fields. And so we can be, just as we receive, um, so can energy be taken from us. And also um, in a kind of unconscious way. Now, um, we, we've all been, I'm sure, around people who drain us. You know, after maybe after encountering somebody, <laughs> we walk away and go, whoa, that person just sucked the life out of me, you know? Um, it doesn't, it's, it's, not a negative, it's not a negative statement or a judgment. It's just referring to someone's state. They may be a pleasant person, but it just, that for some reason, their energy fields draw from our own. Now, there are, there are also people who do it in, have an, uh, do have a um, not a, a positive energy state. I've, I refer to them um, casually as, as psychic vampires. <laughs> they seem to draw <laughs> energy from us. Um, yes. So um, there, there's a great um, line uh, from Persian poetry that says, when you enter a garden, would you sit next to the thorn bush or the rose bush? So we can choose where we place ourselves. And so I would say managing our energy is also about recognizing which environments in our daily lives um, bolster our energy and are good for us and those which drain us. And we should make a conscious decision of where to place our energy and be responsible for energy, for our energy. And um, so that's some of the things that I talk about, um, that we do have responsibility, that energy is um, a quantitative value also. And we, we, it can be taken from us and we can deliberately give it out and share it. And there are times when we should seek those moments where we can boost our own energy, perhaps by, as I mentioned, reconnecting with a joyous state or memory. And we can put these, and we can put these practices into all walks of life. If we're going for a job interview, for example, we want to bolster ourselves, we should step back, 
maintain our energy and reconnect with an event or memory which will bolster us and we can boost our, our state. So it's about understanding that states are quantitative values also because we are part of, an, of a, um, a world that does manifest physically. So obviously we, we feed into that. So the book, again, or, or what I talk about in general, is about bridging the exterior world with the interior world and trying to create practices for ourselves where we can manage that, that um, communication. So it doesn't detract or drain us or distract us from, from where we need to be in our lives, Susan. And as you said, polishing that bridge is so important. Um, And as you were speaking about the inner homeland, uh, I was thinking, you know, just sitting in the safety of the center of our physical body and being present in the moment and how difficult modern day life makes that, makes it difficult to do that and how important it is to do so. And I want to say, too, that your book gives lots of practical examples. Uh, examples and I found it very very helpful so I want to encourage readers to explore it it was very good yeah thank you for that Um, yes but you know Kingsley perhaps our greatest disempowerment is fear and as you have said this may be especially true in regards to going to our inner homeland and it seems to me that one of the causes of this fear may be our internalization of outer authority, be that religious, social, or political, and it's a critical inner voice of judgment and condemnation. I'm sure we can all imagine where that might come from. This inner voice might might at first feel to further disempower, undermine the fragile self-esteem, and that then might generate more fear. How do you suggest we approach fear itself? and any internalization of these outer authorities that we might discover. Mm. That's an important, important point there, Susan, um, because really the uh, majority of our um, let's say obstacles in life and disempowerment in life is based around fear and the protection we put on fear. And I feel that a lot, in, in a lot of the times, we, we are our worst enemies in the sense that we bolster the, the presence of fear. Um, <laughs> and by, you know, we, we make it larger and more gargantuan than it actually is. It's, it's probably a little, in reality, it's a little um, lizard or salamander and we make it into a Godzilla. Um. <laughs> but I, think, I do think, Kingsley, that we're saturated everywhere by things that generate fear. And it's part parcel of consumerism that we're drowning in that's the extraction mode that's how Mm -hmm. energy is taken i think yeah it is and and it's part of the social conditioning because fear um creates a dependency upon external structures Yes. And it, it's what the um, the great, well, the well-known sociologist Stanley Milgram talked about in his famous experiment, obedience to authority. Mm-hmm. Um, have, have we talked about this experiment before? Are we familiar yes, with it? But go, uh, yes, but repeat it. It's worth repeating if you don't mind, Kingsley. No, sure. I just didn't want to um, put, put any listeners through a, a repetitive phase. <laughs> um, the the experiment was, was done in... Uh, in I think it was Harvard University, one of the major ones, and uh, the sociologist took his students and put them in in lab coats, white lab coats, i.e., looked like they were doctors of authority, and he created he uh, a false experiment whereby his plan was to bring in people um, off the street, just volunteers, and to ask get them to ask questions to people behind um, in another room, behind a window. And every, and every time this person answered the question incorrectly, the volunteer was told by the person in the, light, in the white lab coat to press a buzzer to give him an electric shock as punishment. Now, of course, the people playing the, the role of the person answering the questions were, again, his, the, the, um, the professor's students who were told to answer incorrectly. To, to, give the volu- to make the volunteers give them electric shock. So what happened was that these volunteers followed 
the orders of these actors, students in, in lab coats, to increasingly give stronger and stronger electric shocks every time the person answered incorrectly. And the person was, was screaming in the other room. Of course, the actors were screaming. There was no um, pain involved. And these, these levels of electrocution were so high that the, it, was, it was, you know, really pushing the pain barriers. And I think in this experiment, about 95% of the people continued to give increasing electric shocks and, and really just obeyed orders. Because the important thing is, is that they felt they didn't have any responsibility because they were told to do it by someone in authority. Mm. And, and that pattern of behavior has been involved in a lot of the great atrocities of human behavior in, in our centuries. Is that we, in one hand, we, are, we feel dependent upon authority, which is social conditioning, because we, we grow up first you know we through our in our families our parents our role models then we go to school we have teachers who are in in authority then we have um civil in in life the uh, civil um, p um people in authority whether police or magistrates etc basically anyone wearing a uniform and so we are conditioned to respond to that in obeyance that's the first point the second point is that by being in obeyance, we feel that we don't have responsibility to the self. And so we, we disempower ourselves by giving up that responsibility. Now, fear works upon that. And, yes. and the, the German um, social psychologist Eric Fromm uh, called this syndrome the fear of freedom. Hmm. Um, <laughs> because in a sense, if, if we, um, it's almost if fear feeds us because if we break away from this, uh, this uh, authority and the fear which is in, involved in it, we feel like kind of set adrift. You know, where's our points of reference? Who, who's an authority? Who's going to tell me what to do? Yes. Well, the answer is you should be telling yourself what to do. But we, many of us have been growing up in de um, societies of dependency where, you know, our thought structures are given to us. Our jobs are given to us. Our food's given to us on the local supermarket shelf. We just have to walk down the street and pick it up. You know, um, that t type of dependency is disempowering us. And so fear um, is a part of all these structures of mainstream society, obedience. And we, we just take it into ourselves almost, almost automatically, but I think also unconsciously we take it in because we've been conditioned that that's part of the obedience to authority and that's what we need. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have to break away from. We have to realize that self-empowerment is the core of living meaningful lives and really developing ourselves. And that means that we have to disengage from fear without having any fear in that disengagement. Yes. Um, and that, that's very powerful and um, unconsciously, it's maybe more difficult than, than it may seem. Yes, and when we do take responsibility and begin to act more mature, that uh, our self-esteem will begin to build. It will move from an infantile self-esteem that is so dependent on what others say. It will begin to build about the successes that we have. And we're not going to be successful every single time. We'll, we will make mistakes, but we'll build enough. And then that will counteract this fragility of sense of self. And uh, it's time to stop being children and that that's kind of scary some for some people it is and, and well put i like that phrase the fragility of the self um the self in in this context has a fragility yet on the other hand it has it's it's so durable it endures it's yes self is so resilient but at the moment um, it's like, a, as you said, um, if we break away from this fear, then the development will be organic and natural once it's allowed to be so, because that's its natural state. It's like a coiled spring. You know, it's been, it's been 
um, you know, it's, in, it's coiled, it's, it's not let loose. But once <laughs> you take away those, those, those um, confining parameters, then it'll just spring out and growth will be organic and natural and perhaps, m- most likely, I, I feel, faster than, than we may anticipate because that it's been held back for so long. Um, we just really have to trust ourselves and nobody else can make those decisions for us. Um, responsibility really is with the self and that is that's why we talk about the inner homeland is we have to have the conversations with ourselves to build up the trust and and Mm -hmm. to take the steps ourselves and and that trust will build each time we have a bit of that organic growth as we begin to blossom like a beautiful flower Mm -hmm. so thank you for that yeah Kingsley, this is Dave again. Um, In the final part of your book, you write about the spirituality versus consumerism as uh, a means of transition, that we've often been led to believe that our self-development is just another transaction and that we've been conditioned to believe in this supply and demand type of self-development of spirituality that gives away our authority to an external source, uh, a source which delivers something upon some form of payment. Would you share or expand upon these thoughts, please? Mm. That's right, Dave. Thank you. Um, it, it, this all ties into what we've been talking about, about the consumerist lifestyle, is that part of that conditioning um, is that we we consider that in order to get anything of of worth it's a transaction and it kind of fits into this supply and demand uh, relationship people say oh you don't get anything for free mate um type of thing and we say well you know if it didn't cost anything then it probably wasn't worth it you know we talk in these terms and these terms have been taken over into how um spirituality or rather disingenuous spirituality has been packaged and we we can see this in a lot of you know, maybe in some guru phenomena as well. Uh, I'm not saying not all gurus or all spirituality or spiritual teachings are false. Of course not. We have to distinguish between ourselves. But they, you know, often the the seeker um, is has been conditioned to to look for spirituality in these terms, and so we we have to pay for something, and we have. You have to give something, such as enrolling and giving 10% of your monthly earnings to a certain institute, and then you get teachings in return. You know, that seems fair because, you know, you don't get anything for nothing, mate, type of mentality. But on the other hand, it also implies that if you, since you've paid for it, then you, know, you have to have it. So it's, <laughs> it's the same thing about modern education these days. Um, I'm not, I'm not going off track, but I, I worked in university and most students now have to pay for university. And so um, the university department says, well, you can't fail them because their parents will come and say, well, I've paid for them. Um, you've got to deliver the product. And it's the same thing in spirituality is that it's almost as if we are conditioned to pay for something. And therefore, we as a consumer expect to get a product delivered to us. And this this all kind of ties into this almost dead universe worldview is that, you know, everything has to be a, a, a transaction um, and um, even you know, to get meaning out of it. And so that also takes responsibility away from us. And because if we pay for something, we expect something. So we, we just have to um, go through the, the A's and B's of the process. And, you know, um, just like taking an online course, we just, you know, go through the motion and we'll get a product. This all ties into the commodity culture, ties into modern life and ties into fear as well, because the fear is I don't have to do it for myself. Well, you know, we, we, that doesn't really serve any meaningful purpose. Um, we do have to do it for ourselves. We do have to walk our own steps and ride our own bicycles. Um, um, as as a, a modern contemporary teacher once said, he said, look, um, I can I can hand a bike to you, but there's no way I'm going to ride the bike for you. That's your responsibility. And I think that is more or less sums it up, is that we have to ride the bike with our own two feet and our own exertion and exhaustion. But by doing that, the natural organic 
way the universe responds is that it will respond to the capacity of what we have generally put into our um, ourselves and that applies to everything not only spirituality but the world around us our again how we approach fear how we approach conditioning um, we should not shy away from that responsibility and it doesn't it's not a, it's not a hurtful process responsibility doesn't hurt it just means that we have to start standing up for ourselves and being mature um, has that answered your question Dave Yes, it has very much, and the the bicycle analogy is wonderful. Somebody can teach you how to ride and how to move your feet and how to move the handlebars in order to go in a direction you want, but ultimately you're the person that has to do it for yourself. And riding a bicycle is sure fun. (laughs) And even if you fall off and graze your knees a few times, that's all part of the enjoyment of growing up, isn't it? Kingsley, would you tell us about your website and uh, any information you'd like to direct people to on, on your website? Thank you, Susan. Yes, I, I, my website is my name, kingsleydennis.com. You can just Google my name, Kingsley Dennis. Uh, luckily, there's not many of us out there. You can find it quite easily. I, I put a lot of material on the website. I, I have many articles free for downloading. I have articles in Spanish and French. And also I put out a newsletter every month, which I write an article for. And also I put out uh, news links and, and web links and video links. So um, that my web page is like my where I, where I exist on the web. And you can find out a lot more from me and what I've written about there. And please, I try to provide everything just for free to take so people can inform themselves. This concludes part one of two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis.